This is based on a paper that I wrote more than a decade ago. But yeah, I had several discussions with people here about uh, both mixed array, but also about the growth of coefficients in in in, um, in asymptotic expansion. How can you actually really compute the, the, the growth rate? And there are two things here. Maybe let's go to the next slide already. Um, so first of all, is the definition of um, Givre order, and probably everyone knows that because many of you actually have tried to compute it. And ideally, you end up with that Givre order is one, but it can be something else, of course. So S is the Givre order here. And the second reason that I wanted to give this talk was also that part of it is also that I wanted to also introduce more about the cauchy heine transform. Most of you probably have seen Borel transforms. cauchy heine transform is another tool that actually you should know a bit because it's very useful. And it's in a way simpler than the Borel transform. And you can also obtain asymptotics for the, the, the coefficients of, and asymptotics for the terms uh, in your expansion. When I started working on this, this, I created two examples and you will see them in this talk. They are not created to be complicated. They actually create, they, these are the first examples that I encountered and they are simple. And they are probably good examples of what can happen if you if your Givre order is not one. In the end, I will say something about that you can always switch your Givre order from one to the other. But the, the, the point here is actually that it has connect, it's connected to the, this remark here at the bottom uh, that you can read. I actually start with an example. I don't start with my general Givre class and all the, the possible solutions. I know I actually start with a, with a simple ODE that lives in a certain Givre class, and I work with that. And then, then I just try to get everything that you can obtain for it. But in this talk, I will start with Givre order one, and also introduce the cauchy heine transform. When when I encountered this the first time, I wasn't aware of it. I just started playing around, as you will see in a moment. And when Frank Olpen and I looked at a particular problem, we called it the Stuntis transform, but in the literature, it's more better known as the cauchy heine transform. But then I relatively switched to Givre order a half, where all the solutions are of Givre order a half for third order differential equation. And in the end, I will look at a third order differential equation where you have both Givre order a half and Givre order one. And you, again, you can see what happens in that case. My first proper encounter with resurgence was actually, and it's, it's almost 30 years ago. In, in the most time, it is 30 years ago. It was not the first real encounter because I've also seen the papers by Michael Barry and Chris House, but I didn't really spot the resurgence in those papers, and I also, and I also didn't trust the results because they were highly non-rigorous, but any numerical check did show me that they were actually correct. So, but the, the first encounter that I saw is connected to second order differential equation. This happened the day after my um, PhD defense. Uh, there was a conference for Nico Temme. He was 25 years at the Mathematical Center in Amsterdam. There was a big conference for him. Frank Olver was one of the speakers, and he spoke about something completely new. new. And it is about uh, second order linear differential equation, z is the large variable, the well known asymptotic expansions that you probably have seen before. It's a linear differential equation, so you also have connection formulas. If you move from one Riemann sheet to the next one, there's a simple connection, and that is as a function of one sheet, you can express in the next sheet, but the constant in front of these and one of them is known and it depends as if one of them is known and that it depends on this growth of z to the power mu one. And the other one is the total multiplier, as most of you are known, and it's typically unknown for these problems. Only in special cases can you actually compute it analytically. But this is not it. This is probably 
ancient history, but of ancient mathematics. But it's about this result here at the bottom. Everyone can see it. That's the first rejection that I encountered. That the late coefficients of the first expansion are in terms of the early coefficients of the second expansion multiplied times factorial. So it's clearly factorial over power growth there. The power is actually one in this case, that's how it's being created. And this is something that Frank Oliver used, and he also did hyperdense plotics with this, but I only focus on this result here. And he was also friendly enough to, to, to give me his, the, the, the draft of his paper for this. He didn't use any Barol techniques. He also didn't use what I'll show you in a moment. He actually just took the recurrence relations for these coefficients and worked out everything from there. And he also, at the same time, did um, remainder estimates, which of course is a lot of work. And the draft paper that he gave me was about 60 pages. And I was surprised, like, how can you have such a beautiful result here and it takes 60 pages to prove it? Especially if you plug in for the gamma function, just in um, integral representation, and you play around. And if you do that, then you end up with something. So, this is early and late. What, what is early? I don't see this early yet. So, late means that, that here, this is for asymptotics for S going to infinity. And uh, late means assessment from zero. Okay, that early means assessment from zero. So the yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we just take M two. So if you truncate this, then the start with gamma of S, and then you get S minus S, so that is the correct order that you should expect. And M is arbitrary. M is arbitrary, but but finite. You don't want to take you don't want to take more than an S term because then the gamma can be start behaving badly. And if you look typically for problems like this, the optimal number of terms, the optimal in this expansion is N is S over two. So it's again this is a divergent expansion. But if you replace these gamma functions by uh, these gamma functions just by their integral representation and play around and you deal with divergent theories. But then you seem to end up with something like this, that AS is equal to a constant times an integral of the second solution, W2 at minus T times T to some power, S minus mu1 minus one. That seems, but that can't be true because we don't make any assumption what happens in the finite plane. So I have no idea what happens in the origin. We only assume that at infinity we have an irregular singularity of rank one. So that's one reason that it can't be true. So what are the assumptions of F and G? F and G are uh, 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 analytic at infinity. In the yes, yeah. only that. So we, we don't assume anything anywhere else. So you could have other uh, singularities in, in, in the finite plane as well. This is only about what happens at infinity. So this integral representation can't be correct because we have no idea what happens in the origin. However, for asymptotics, uh, when S is large, if you look at an integral like this, so by the way, of two as an exponential, and we have minus T, so actually it decays properly at infinity. So at infinity, everything is fine. It's just at the origin that we don't trust it. The origin in a way is not important because I mean that for S is large and the main contribution in that case comes from what happens at infinity. And if you replace W2 by asymptotic expansion and put it in, then you get this result. So zero is actually totally not important. It could be any positive number there as long as it's finite and it's still correct. But then the, the, the result doesn't make any sense anymore. How can you prove anything like that directly? But still, that's the cauchy heine transform, as you will see in the next page. So I start with these two asymptotic expansions at infinity, and you need the connection relation as well. And if you do that, then actually those are not the nice functions. It's actually nice that if I, if at infinity, my main solution behaves like one over that. 
So this is just a rescaling, nothing else. I, both solutions are multiplied times the same factor, the z to the power minus mu one minus one. And then one of them becomes simple and the other one is complicated, that's not a problem. And also the connection relation becomes a little bit simpler because we don't get this ether power two pi i mu one anymore, because mu one in, in the meantime is an integer. So you just get that still the same Stokes multiplier. And this is the difference of the two v ones on different Riemann sheets. So I haven't done anything yet. I just scaled it. But this is slightly nicer. And now I just do simple Cush and complex analysis. I can always write my function here as a Cauchy in a Cauchy integral presentation. Typically, that's not very useful if you don't know anything else. But in this case, we, have, we can actually take a very nice simple contour and take this one here. So Z is somewhere inside this contour. So Z is somewhere here. This contour encircles it. It's created in such a way that the, the large circle here, if you push it to infinity, then it will disappear because the V1 itself behaves like one over T and there's another T there. So at infinity, it behaves like one over T squared. So you can push it to infinity. And then this remaining green circle here is a finite circle, but you will see in, in a moment that it doesn't contribute anything at all in the asymptotics. And for the black curve here, they go in opposite direction and they actually on different Riemann sheets and there you can actually plug in this connection relation. So this is V1 at Z and this is V1 at Z times e to the power minus two pi i. So you plug that in, then the, the black integral becomes just this part here, this part of the Cauchy integral. And the green one, we just keep, we don't do anything with that one because it's not important. This row one that you see here is just a certain distance that I need. That's the radius of that green curve. It's finite. I don't know how large to take it, but that, that's not important. And this is an exact result. What have I achieve, achieved? Because this, this is an integral presentation here. You see another integral presentation. But the difference is that v, this V2 at T along the negative real axis is exponentially decaying. So this integral here, you can actually expand this one of t minus z via a geometric progression, and you get an asymptotic expansion. So this one is very friendly for asymptotics. You can just, this is a finite integral, so then you can do the same. So both of them can be expanded, and that means that you can get uh, integral representations for the coefficients, like the one that you see here, and you have an exact integral representation for the remainder. So how, how do you see that the sum cannot be exponentially large? That is exponentially decaying so that each of the kind of each is exponentially small. But the sum could be exponentially large. Which sum of the sum from s equal to zero to infinity a x to the power by t to the power x. Oh no, 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 the, 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 that sum is the divergent. I'm not, I'm not talking about this bit here. I'm talking about the, this is all about the functions. This is not about the series anymore. The, these are these are clearly divergent series here. Okay, but why is that exponential decay? No, there, no, no, the, the, because of this bit here. This is the main behavior at infinity. The, so if you, the no, no, but the, the, the rest behaves that the, the first term here is, is, is one. That's the dominating term. Okay, but if you see the series divergent, that's not. No, you do, because it's, a, it's an asymptotic expansion. So you know that if you truncate it, even if you truncate it there after one term, then the remainder is small compa compared to the rest. So the, the, sum is not, the, the, the sum is not the function. The sum is the asymptotic expansion of the function. Okay. That's a different <laughs> So no, you're right. So this is divergent series, and that's what I want. They all grow, these coefficients, and these coefficients, they grow like uh, factorial. But this result here will automatically give you the result that Frank Over had. So, I, so two days after his talk, I gave him this method here, and then we this wrote, rewrote the whole paper and based on the hyperasymptotics on what we did here. 
but the we just call it a field dispense probe for the obvious reason that it's here. And the books that I know, uh, when they talk about Cauchy Heine transform, they only talk about this bit here. They, they, I've never seen that, anything that, that, that makes this an, an exact result here. But with this contain, this is the only thing that you need for the asymptotic here. However, in, for many special functions, you can actually push the row to zero. And that means that this disappears and you just get the interval of zero to infinity. Funny enough, this paper for Frank Goldman was the second in the series. In the first uh, part of that series, he, he just worked with the confluent hypergeometric function. And he did use, he did also derive uh, exponentially proved asymptotics for that example. And he did use this integral of the representation. Which was known already, but that's a special case of what you saw on the previous page. It's a bit weird if you see it for the first time. Yes, if you probably start looking for uh, integrals for the complex hypergeometric functions, you go to any uh, book of special functions, you see this integral, and you probably immediately say, "Okay, that's pointless because the function itself reappears." But this reappear, this reappearance that you see, this is the second solution of the complex hypergeometric function. And we're not going to do anything deep with it. We, we, you, it's only there uh, to get an exact remainder. The nice thing about this integral is that, it, is that that is just living here. So it's easy to get asymptotics from it. We already know what the coefficients are. The coefficients we get from the differential equation. The recurrence relation is coming from the differential equation. So we know what the coefficients are. So you don't use these integrals to compute the coefficients. But you do use them to deal with the late asymptotics, the late term asymptotics, and also for re expansions if you want to. Special cases of this uh, one that you probably have used, if you have ever given a course on asymptotics, you probably always use this integral here. And that's the main one. But that, that is actually one of these, these examples because it's a special case of this result here when b is equal to a. Then you get the incomplete gamma function, and what this is special case of that one. Again, this is well known. And one that's less known is actually when b is equal to two times a. Then you get Bessel functions, and Gergen Namus used this to, to to actually get sharp error bounds for these Bessel functions that you can see here. Another case is uh, these parabolic cylinder functions. Again, I don't. I haven't seen that in the literature yet, but it follows directly from the result up there. And when I gave a talk uh, last year at the first part of this uh, program in the summer school, I also mentioned that you can even do it for nonlinear problems. This is an integral representation which shouldn't exist for Panda Bay one. Panda Bay 1, the, the, the nice version for asymptotics is given there. That's this nonlinear equation. This is one of the um, trigger and case solutions. And it can be expressed in terms of an integral again, where the entry step is the remainder in the trend series expansion. So we're summing here from n is 1, infinity for u0 is not included. And if you, if you want to use this, you can use this also to, again, study the growth of the coefficients of these terms and do hyper asymptotics with it if you want to. So there's no Borel analysis at all here. All of this can be done with just um, playing around with asymptotic expansions that live in large sectors in the complex plane and using also the connection relation. So and I just to emphasize all of these results that you can see here, you can just use geometric regressions. You get exact representations for the coefficients. And more importantly, you can deal with the remainder. And that's typically the hardest bit if you do exponential asymptotics. You want to get something nice for the remainder. So hopefully I convince you that maybe Cauchy Heine is something that you can use sometimes. And the, the main thing actually to, to emphasize here is, is that I don't know what the growth of the coefficient is to start with. I only have the, 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 my asymptotic expansion. So I, so in this case, I know 
what my original expansion is, and I also know what I'm switching on. And at the moment that you do know that, then this can be used to actually look at the growth of the coefficients. And you will see that in a moment as well. Maybe speak a few words about uh, Givray order one. So all of this was done before I've ever seen any Borel transform. This was all based on uh, just this uh, cauchy heine trick. When I wanted to generalize this to answer differential equations, then actually it becomes slightly more, uh, it becomes easy to actually use the Borel transform. So if you have an n the problem where you have n divergent expansions, like what you can see here, then the Borel transform uh, that I prefer to introduce is also one that actually the, 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 the Suzanne mentioned in his talk, and it, it's based on, 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 on dividing by factorial, but I prefer to actually write it as an inverse factorial, there's a minus s there, and also to use loop contours for the Laplace transform. So not integrating from the point itself. So this is a problem where you have n exponentials. Those are the important points in my Borel plane here. And one of the solutions is a, defined as an in the loop contour of the Borel transform. In this way here, you just integrate around that singularity. And so that is the thing that at the starting point, which is something that most people also don't do, but to me it's more friendly because I don't discriminate between the, the, the starting point and, and all of the other points. All of them are equal in this sense. And the connection relation that, you, that exists here is just that the solution that's defined, uh, defined as um, lambda k has this singular behavior and lambda m, and that's all that you need to, to do hyper with, 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 yeah. At the moment that you have this, so some nice contour integrals and exact knowledge of happens at singularities, you can do, hi do hyper asymptotics. There's, there's nothing complicated anymore after that, except a lot of bookkeeping. And this that you can also then in general write down what is the growth of the coefficients in these divergent expansions. So you will get uh, many Stokes multipliers that have to be computed. And some of them will be dominant, some of them will be less dominant because the, 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 the lambda that you saw in the previous space are further away from the starting point. But they all contribute. And it could be that one is very far away, so that it doesn't, that it doesn't really contribute in, in these expenses immediately, but sometimes, so in that, those cases, you have to go deeper into the hyper asymptotic free. I'm not going to talk about that today, but all of these things can be done, and all of them contain resurgence at many, many levels. But my main focus is actually about other Givre orders. And here you see a simple example of Givre order half. It's just a simple linear third order differential equation looks completely innocent. Here you see the three possible asymptotic expansions. You can just plug them in and you can compute all the coefficients. But notice already that we have actually squares here. And just for the next slide, I'm not always going to tell you again what the exponential growth are. All of them grow like e to the power, a constant times that square, as you can see here. So let's call that maybe j. And then the J that you see at the bottom here is the object that multiplies Z squared. So the first one is just, there's no exponential behavior, so that's zero times Z squared. This one in the positive direction dominates, and this one is the smallest. And you have cubic order, so second order is just this kind of that, that you have, should grade order one half. No, no, you can get it as well, but it's, uh, you will see why I wanted this one in a moment as well. But you can, you can get it at all levels because you, because you can always uh, take a problem with certain Givre orders and then take the, the correct Laplace transform of the correct order and switch it to any other Givre order. So that, that's not a problem. But I just wanted to start with simple OD. Here. 
Can you find an example where transmonomial z squared is separate from transmonomial z? Or they, they always appear combined in the argument that we can Oh, you mean that this is two different yes. sets minus that this is that this is minus that cut minus that so it's separate into two different contributions in a different example. Oh, you will see that in, 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 oh. by in a way that you might say that's already the case here, but nobody you will see it in, in the final example yes, I think. Um, so here are the, the rook slash for coefficients. The only thing that you should spot, and maybe that's the easiest to spot in, in the one in this middle here, is that. Here I have an n multiplying bn, here the same, so roughly they are of the same order, of the same growth. Here I have n squared in front of bn minus 1. But that's not an n squared in, in front of bn. So you have to go two lower from bn plus 1 to bn minus 1 to get an n squared, or an extra n, I mean. And that shows you that they already hear that this is probably the very order of half. There are many, many, in this case, there are many solutions uh, because these are divergent uh, expansions in particular directions. So for W0, that's the one that behaves like Z to the power alpha. The Stokes lines are the real and imaginary axis. And um, you can see here that there are, so the, the, that's the first one here. There are four of those solutions on one particular Riemann sheet and uh, two of the other types of solutions on the other Riemann sheet. And the only thing that's special in this problem is, is that the, the equation itself, um, the solution is all entire function. So if you walk around once completely, then you should end up with the same solution, and that gives you these relations here. That is special, and then that will be useful uh, in a moment. So there are many strokes phenomena, as I was saying, for W0, the, the, the imaginary and, and the the real axis are the Stokes curve. So at the moment that you, for example, cross this positive imaginary axis, then this is the connection relation that is connected to it. So you have two solutions that behave like the z to the power alpha, and it switches on one of the solutions that behaves like e to the power z squared. e to the power z squared is maximally dominant in this direction, subdominant, I mean, in that direction. So there are many Stokes multipliers. In total, there are 12. Stokes multiplies that have to be computed. We have Cauchy Hine integral computation. So, this is slightly more complicated than what you saw before because there are more Stokes phenomena, there are more connection formula. So, for W0, you have a sum of four integrals where you integrate along the Stokes lines. So, these are all the Stokes lines that you saw on the previous page. And these are the, the, the small circles. So these ones, the, the, these final four integrals are the ones that we can disregard in a moment. But with this, you can actually now also do study the growth of the coefficients. So you obtain that the AN behaves like these integrals here. I haven't plugged in for the, the Ws yet, their asymptotic behavior. But as you remember, they behave like e to the power plus or minus z squared minus z. So those integrals are not any more simple gamma functions. They're slightly more complicated. They are of this form here. That's the growth of the coefficient. They can be, they are known functions. They are, they can be expressed in terms of parabolic cylinder functions. And you can also just obtain the asymptotics uh, either by just using the saddle point method on, on the object itself or maybe using asymptotic results that are known in the literature, but then you can see that they grow actually like uh, a half factorial gamma over two, but there's something extra. There's also the extra gamma in the explanation. So if you wouldn't know what your very class you were in, and you would just start trying to, to match your growth with uh, so multiply times, so say uh, something times n, s times n, what I wrote before, then you probably think, oh, this is getting close to a half, but there's something wrong. And that's because you're missing this extra factor here. And it's not easy to spot if you just play around with the growth of the coefficients. But it follows directly from using Cauchy-Heine and playing around with the, 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 the 
assume the essence of the cup is integral. So the, the last time, what is the assumption equation? Which variable is linked? Okay. Oh, no, this is for uh, no, 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 this is for uh, for gas, for example. Yeah. I should have written that. Yep. Why Oh, that's because that that, that these um, W W that you see here, W one was behaving like e to the power and z squared minus z plus the rest. So at the moment that you take one of these um, integrals up there, if you take this one here, that that is a W one. So this is replaced by e to the power z squared minus z. So in most problems that you have encountered, the, the z squared isn't there, and then you automatically get. Uh, so it probably helps if I actually would have told that um, e squared. Some some of you might still say most clearly it's the ray or the half, and that's all we need to worry about. But this is relevant if you try to just figure out yourself what the growth of the coefficient is. More questions? And these functions are also actually the, the, the obvious one that you want to do when you want to do resurgence. Because at the moment, because for resurgence, all I'm doing is actually re replace these Ws up here by their asymptotic expansions, which start with these things here. And those integrals, yes, you can ex work extremely hard and try to push out uh, gamma functions, but then you don't have any resurgence left. It, it, it's not a clean expansion anymore in the coefficients of these expansions. But if you, at the moment, that you accept these, um, P functions here as approximate, then you just end up with asymptotic expansions in terms of these P functions. So all of them just behave roughly like the gamma of uh, N over 2. And these are four expansions. And unfortunately, again, they're all divergent, so you should definitely not turn to infinity. You should uh, turn to the smallest term. And in that case, you get no information about uh, this coefficient here, because in this expansion, the first term here is smaller than the smallest term in this expansion. So numerically, you will get no information from this or this one here. But you all really can compute if you take the optimal number of terms in the expansions. And they're still simple. The coefficients are the ones that you, that, that you can compute very easily. We have very simple reconciliations for that. And these p functions are just parabolic cylinder functions, so they're easy to compute as well. So three of the four Stokes multipliers that you can, can compute in this way. You get similar results for the other expansions, so that's not important. So there are four Stokes multipliers that I can't compute at this level. If this would be Jure order one, then I would just tell you, uh, just go to the next level in hyperasymptotics. But in here, that would be very messy. It's more complicated to go to the next level. Theoretically, it's possible, but I wouldn't do that. It's also not necessary for this case because we have more information. So I can compute eight or so of the Stokes multipliers, the 12 Stokes multipliers. But there are more equations because I also can use the fact that this is an, an entire, uh, that all the functions are entire functions. So if I walk around once in the opposite, once around from the positive real axis in the upper half plane or negative half plane to the negative real axis and use all my connection relations, then I get two results and W at zero. I can express it in terms of the W's that live on the other side. This is in the upper half plane. This would be in the lower half plane. But this function and this function, they have the same asymptotic expansion. And hence, these, up, these coefficients here should be approximately the same. You can see that in the next page, you get this equation here. This is related to that one times a simple extra exponential. So these are extra identities that you can get. 
And in that way, you can compute all the missing total multipliers. You have many of these equations. Actually, you have more equations. These are just five equations that you need for these five missing total multipliers. There are four extra equations, and they you can just use afterwards to check your results numerically, to verify your results numerically. So stokes multipliers can still be computed in that way, but there are other methods. So I'm not going to emphasize. What about the Borel transform? But that's also something that I mentioned in the abstract. And the Borel transform, in this case, you really have to divide by gamma of n over two, which somehow looks a bit like having to take your Laplace transform or inverse Laplace transform with respect to um, squared. So that's the, the, the main difference, but it has consequence. So first of all, if, if you do that, then the, the Laplace transform of mu to the, u to the power n is an extra factor of gamma of a half n, so that's nothing you would, especially you probably would expect that and the same with the Borel transform. But in a way you, you, you get two, Borel transform that are slightly independent. You get this one here, and the difference is an extra factor of that here. And, and the reason you will see on the next page why I, I say that they are slightly independent. Um, oops, sorry, I think it went too far. Yep. The original differential equation in terms of the Borel language will give you this equation here. So that's an equation involving the, the, the capital H, that is that um, Borel transform and the little h, which is this Borel transform in one equation. Okay, so differential equations so where you might be happy. Uh, however, the connection between the two is given here. And this is a fractional derivative. So the equation that you saw in the, in the previous slide is not a simple differential equation, it's a fractional differential equation. When I gave this talk uh, at, at Warwick about 10 years ago, uh, Delfray was in the audience and he said, oh, but, but this must be wrong. There's nothing special about Javray Jav half because you can easily go from any Jure class to any Jure class, positive Jure class by just uh, taking the correct Borel or Laplace transform. However, the difference is I started here with a problem in Jure class a half. And if I want to translate that to either the Borel plate or maybe if you prefer to Jure order one, then you will end up that your original simple differential equation becomes a fractional differential equation. So the reason that you haven't encountered any of these issues that you saw here with weird growth or fractional derivatives in the Borel plane is because you started with a simple differential equation of PDE in your uh, Jouvre one world. Yep. Yeah, you, you can do that. Well. But you still have the same issues that, that if you try to, you still end up at two separate objects in a way. Uh, the, 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 or, or you might say that at least this equation can't be simplified any further, whether it's the powers of u or u to the power half. I don't think it simplifies, but maybe we can discuss this afterwards. Yeah, I <laughs> no, no, I definitely tried that. No, it was it, it's obvious to try that, yes. And, uh, and the, 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 but but I did notice that I can't that I couldn't get a simple. I, I only wanted to have one. And yes, at the moment, if you make this to the power of half, that's the power. So you take the square of that uh, everywhere. Uh, 
you still somehow these two objects seem to be independent, especially if you, if you take the original differential equation and you yeah, translate that one. That's exactly what you want to see here as well. What about uh, singularities in the brown frame? That's something I haven't encountered yet. So this is very technical what you can what you see here. That there are two uh, directions that I can integrate. I mean, if you normally if you want to compute singularities in the brown frame, then you would probably start from your typically at the origin, you, you integrate in one direction. You integrate in another direction, and in between you have a singularity, so the loop contour around it. You study that one, and then you figure out what the singular behavior is. That's what I'm doing on this slide as well. So this is a one direction, that's another direction. Then I look at the difference, and I expand it. And the only thing that you should maybe see on this whole big slide is this This is an essential singularity at one. It's not simple branch points anymore. You can definitely get essential singularities in this case. Everything is much more complicated in that case. And there's no way out of that. This is still the, the, the correct expansion. Yeah, the coefficients are still relatively nice, and you, you can do some proper analysis with it, but it's not as user friendly as what we had before. It has to be, in a way, the, 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 the big warning or lesson that, um, yes, it is possible to encounter essential singularities in the browser. And of course, I could have gone the other way around and start with something like this and then maybe create a problem that at, at a higher level that will have this behavior in the browser. But I didn't do that. I just started the Q-ray order. Aha, I didn't, I was not aiming for this. This was just a consequence of it. Okay, now my final example. Many of the details are similar, so I, I'll skip most of it. Uh, you can either start with this integral representation, and I, at the end, I'll go, come back to this integral representation because, in a way, it tells you everything that you need to know. But let me first translate it again to an ODE. And again, simple third order linear ODE. And the reason that I want a third order in this case is because I wanted to have different orders. And now you have maybe what you what you were asking for. You have a Z squared here. This is actually just a Z and there. And this one we don't know, that's a zero. But if you look a bit deeper and you can see this on the next page, these two spaces are Jabray order one, this is Jabray order a half. All the details are in the integral, so I could stop there, but, but let me just do, show you some details. So again, the coefficients, so there you can actually see that uh, the an coefficient, there's an n there, and the n squared here multiplies to n minus one. So these are roughly of the same size. This, there you have an extra factor of n. So the ans are clearly connected to Jure order half, and the other ones are clearly connected to uh, Jibray order one, because you have an n here and you have an n squared there, so that is clearly Jibray order one. Uh, again, you can do Cauchy Heine, and in that way, you get nice integral presentations for the coefficients and for the remainder. You can then get an um, asymptotic expansion for the coefficients of one of them, that is the c to the power n. And so you have three expansions, but in this case, it's much more dramatic than what you had previously, because this one dominates everything. And not just dominates a little bit, it's, these ones are completely negligible. Because these ones, here are the p functions, and there you have a normal gamma function. So these behave like the gamma of n minus m over two. So the smallest term in this expansion is much bigger than any of these terms, but even if you would do hyper asymptotics to any level, it will always be bigger than what you have here. These are completely negligible, these terms. 
there is no way that you can compute those Stokes multiplies from results like this. <coughs> we have similar expansions for the other coefficients. However, with by just computing them and using all the extra relations that you get, because again, it's an entire, the solutions are entire functions, you can compute all the Stokes multipliers. And the only thing that's important here actually is that the Stokes multipliers are not zero. You might expect that, that the solutions that are uh, much, much smaller than anything you've seen before are ones that you can actually disregard because they are, um, they're not being switched on. No, they are being switched on. The Stokes multipliers are not zero. So all the Stokes phenomena that can happen do happen. Right. Yes. It's a real problem. So yes, you will always have features like that built in. I'm not, I can't remember how many of these dishes are correct. It could be that I only have four correct dishes, but I'm not sure that we, uh, ultimately couldn't be zero, the, the real power. The, there is, a, by the way, another method of computing Stokes multiplies. I mean, and we have listened to talk that people explained how to go, compute Stokes multiplies by maybe zooming into places. You can actually do also compute Stokes multiplies in the original world. You don't have to go into the Borel world to, to compute Stokes multipliers. The KB0S is one of the Stokes multipliers that I couldn't compute with any asymptotics. But there's a very simple way of computing it, and that's explained on this page, but actually I don't want you to read it. it it's actually just explained here. So the, this object here is being switched on, and this object is actually dominant along the negative imaginary axis. So if I start with my W0 function somewhere up here where the asymptot its asymptotic can be computed. I can compute that function up to many, many digits. All I have to do in that case is just take the original differential equation, walk in the original Z plane from say 10 times I to minus 10 times I, compute the function, and then the function must be equal to whatever I get from asymptotic from this one here. And I can just compare. So that's what, what you can do here. And one of the methods that you can use is just simple Taylor series method, but that's explained here, but that's not important. But the main thing is that uh, your Stokes multiply is just a function at minus 10 times i divided by the object that's being fixed on evaluated there, and it just gives you the value. So this is just in the original plane, just walk from one point to another point. And for linear problems, this is always possible. Nonlinear might be more complicated because you might have to walk through regions that are more that are dangerous for numerical integration. Okay, but that's not important. Let me finish with the Borel plane for this mixed Borel example. And in a way, the Borel plane, you could have read it off by just using this simple integral representation. But in a way, I'm just studying this integral representation, which is also a solution of a third order differential equation. So there were two or three behaviors. Uh, one of them was this, what I call W0, uh, which behaves like Z to the power minus alpha over two. But all it is, is from this integral, it's just a loop integral around the origin. The second behavior, W1, is the loop integral around minus one. But those are the only, this is in a way the, 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 the Borel transform. So here you can see the two singularities in the Borel plane. There's one branch point at the origin and there's one branch point at minus one. But I have three behaviors. What's wrong? I should have three branch points. But the third behavior is not at, 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 in the finite plane, it's at infinity. It depends on the Z squared. The, the T squared, as you can see here. Because the difference here with, with normally is you don't have any extra dominating powers in these exponentials. So the object that you can, I mean, if you only focus on the integral, then you probably would know what to do. You probably say, okay, I, I know how to actually 
uh, play around with this Z variable. And at some point, I might also switch on a contour that goes from minus I infinity to plus I infinity. And that's the third behavior. It's contours that go from one value at infinity to another value at infinity, but not necessarily surrounding singularity. And that's extra. But it also has the consequence. Um, is it generic? Only in this example, but uh, but I would expect it to, this to be more more at the moment that you uh, you that you encounter uh, powers in there. I'm thinking just about the So that that this baby, I mean. Yeah, yeah. you expect that if you get the kind of very slow, which is so well, in the previous case, it wasn't the case uh, because there we have split. Huh? Now we have split. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 what, 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 what I think is generic is, is that at the moment that you have uh, different Jouvet behaviors, they're one of the, the then the ones that you push to say from order n factorial to order one. Those will give you the singularities in the Brawl plane, and the rest is still hidden at infinity. I could go, of course, go further and then put, take another Borel transform. I bring that to the final plane, but then, the, but then the other singularities are being pushed to right. the orange. Yeah. What's not slightly is exactly the accelerable stability. The accelerable summation is not very strong. Mm -hmm. But you have cohabitation of several critical times. Uh, you have uh, Z and Z half cohabitation. Uh, you cannot do this only one Borel plane. You need at least two Borel planes. Yeah, but my point is also that, that if I only uh, understand it by doing that at several levels, is that I don't know whether they can actually switch each other on. That's why I also wanted to show the Stokes multipliers, saying that they're all non-zero, so they all will switch each other on at some point. And here in the Borel plane itself, uh, you, you can see that, that yeah, one of the behaviors is still hitting at infinity. Yes, you can bring it down as well, but, but those two are connected to each other. That's all I want to emphasize here. You're absolutely right that you, you, you have to look at the, 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 the independent Borel planes, but, but they're not completely independent. Yeah, I mean, it's still an instance of resurgence, but more complicated because there are these phenomena of cohabitation yeah. time. So it's not a difficult example, that's often that I'm missing in the literature. Yeah. <laughs> Examples. I'm not an expert of accidental but no. it's the first time I very complicated. I was a bit surprised when I read, I think it was in the book of Basel, but I might be wrong, where, where he also did an example with um, playing around with that. And then somebody said, okay, we, we, the result that we get by, by doing this estimation, we, we, the approximate actually is, is not as simple as before, it's the confluent hypergeometric function. That's one of the few examples that, that, that are, were in that paper or book. I can't remember where I saw it. But when I looked at it and just worked out that, oh no, this is just an exponential. So that means that, Hardly anyone has done any examples. And uh, in, in a way, I, I like this example in a way that is by, by just seeing that uh, certainly you ought to have contours from, from one valley to infinity to another valley infinity because I like integral asymptotics. So that's what you encounter here as well. But there's another consequence here, and that is that uh, that at this level, normally when you have an, an, a broad transform with, uh, with only e to the power zt, so, so this, this object isn't there, then you can rotate. And, and do nice uh, analytical continuations. You can't do that here. If you want to rotate, then you have to also um, bring the Z also into the C squared, and everything becomes more complicated. It's still possible, but, it, but it's more complicated. So th this could have been my own example here, just that integral, but, um, because it, it has many of the features that I was talking about. And I think that's the end. Yeah, okay, the rest is just what I mentioned. Thank you very much. More questions? Oh, because you, are, you, you, you have stocks phenomena that they take place not only when you, if you go around once, you have more places. So if you have each of power Z squared, Plus that square, then you have a so uh, the so line at the, the positive imaginary axis, but also the negative imaginary axis. So you get twice as many already. And in this case, we, we, we for one of the solutions, all the axes were 
also uh, where all stocks lie. So if you go once around, you, you have lots of stocks in the middle. So with uh, increasing the with different array orders, but also when you have irregular singularities, if you only think about that, what I started with of a different order, then you you automatically also get more you get small effects of the validity of the original expansion, and you get more stokes lines. So that meant to be because of the You mean higher order stokes phenomena? Yeah, sure. Yeah, but except I don't have a parameter here. So for higher order, you really want things to be moving around. And, uh, but still, the, the number of right, so if you think about Borel plane, because the one way of thinking about higher order is that three singularities line up in the Borel plane. But in Borel plane, we only have three singularities in total. And uh, that they, they potentially they could move to each other, yes. But, but that's but, it's still so it's only because it's the third order differential equation, not because I have more stokes multiplied. Okay, now we speak about it in three weeks. You start the talk. <laughs> yes? Uh, yeah, at the beginning of the I'm not a physicist, so I can't answer that. I never will work with that, but uh, I've noticed. Would be a guess. It relates to the moment. That the moment determines. Now I've seen it. Yes, I can't connect it immediately, but that is useful here as well. And of course, many, many problems where you get a, a, some kind of thesis. If not, then we are just in time for the game to start.